The new ARC90 chassis by DeepCool is a case and CPU cooling solution in one, featuring an integrated Captain Series liquid cooling system with a 280mm radiator and two RGB fans that's tied to a distinct external flow indicator. Combine this with high-end features like tempered glass side panels, EATX support, and tasteful RGB lighting, and the new ARC90 could house your next epic PC build. Click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 25, a monthly Q&A video that I do just about every month. And if you're thinking I've done one somewhat recently in May, you're probably right, but uh, I'm doing another one, so deal with it. Uh, since I do this every month, there is a whole long history, so feel free to check out the playlist if you wanna look at old questions that I have answered in the past which are probably still very relevant. Uh, and of course, all the questions that I'm answering today have been asked by you guys in the comment section from the last video. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle that will never, never truly end. Let's get right to the first question though from Dorfer777. He has an Asus X99M motherboard. He's wondering if he's gonna get better performance from the onboard M.2 slot versus using a PCI Express adapter. Now, your motherboard does need to have support for NVMe, I'm assuming you're talking about an NVMe SSD. And really all you're talking about here is an adapter that's taking a PCI Express signal and adapting it to a different actual connector. If you're using just a basic single slot uh, PCI Express M.2 adapter, you shouldn't see any performance difference between using that connecting directly to an M.2 slot on the motherboard, or even like a U.2. A U.2 uh, port, they didn't really take off, but it's also the same connection standard, just a different physical type of plug. So don't worry about it, as long as you got PCI Express NVMe SSD, uh, that's by two or by four, as long as you're giving it the by two or by four bandwidth, so you have your uh, ex expansion card plugged into the right slot on your motherboard, and of course your motherboard supports MD NVMe, you should be just fine. So don't worry about losing any performance. Next question's from Zikenzi, and this is, a, this is a triple question. I'm actually gonna answer all three of these. I'll try to do it quickly. First, how to prevent GPU sag? Very good question. Lots of people ask about this. So especially if you have a massive graphics card like this uh, Aorus 1080 Ti with three fans and a big old cooling solution, lots of weight on there. So you might get some sag when it's actually installed. And we complain about this when we do pimp my PC on awesome hardware pretty frequently. Uh, I have three possible solutions for you. First one is free. Your PCI Express power cables, uh, if routed upwards, if you have a slot or a pass through on your motherboard tray that you can pass them through, you can do that and kind of put some, uh, some tension on them, tie them back behind the tray, and that can actually pull the GPU up a little bit and prevent GPU sag. It's not as precise and it depends on the case, of course. So I got a couple more options for you guys too. If you want to spend some money, check out M MNPC Tech, uh, Bill Owen's site, and he does a bunch of custom uh, products like uh, braces. And these are a little bit on the more expensive side. This is 50 bucks, but it's custom designed. He's got different ones that are made for different graphics cards. It actually sits in the slot below your graphics card, and it's just a big metal piece that is actually machined and looks pretty cool and provides that support that you need to prevent that GPU sag. Final solution, and this one maybe is also a little bit on the cheaper side, but um, I like something like this. This is actually from the PC Master Race subreddit, but he has used just a little toy, something in there that um, you know provides a little bit of, of character for your computer, and he's just sitting under there holding up the graphics card. So you can do something like that that's sort of an in-between uh, method just to give some support beneath it. I mean, you could even go so far as like to cut a wood dowel or something like that just to put in there and put in place. Just make sure you're, you're making an aesthetic decision to make your computer look better, so make sure whatever you do put in there has sort of a clean finish to it, because otherwise you might as well just stick with the sag. Two more questions, and to answer these, I'm gonna direct you over to an article and a video. First question is, what GPU extender riser cable should he use for his vertical GPU mount? And then follow up, should he even bother going with a vertical GPU mount? I will direct you to this videocards.com article where they actually tested a bunch of different GPU riser cables. The short answer is you wanna go with the higher quality ones. They cost a little bit more, but the power delivery is actually where these tend to suffer. And if you don't have proper power delivery for a graphics card, a lot of these are made for like mining operations operations, which don't really require that much power. Um, but I'll link this article in the video's description, so check it out if you want to read up on that. And there's also some suggested ones that you can order down there. Finally, should you actually bother with a vertical GPU bracket? And I will direct you over to Dimitri's video on Hardware Connects for that. He did some testing with this. 
It's going to depend on your case and how much space you actually have between the graphics card and the side of your case. But in his testing, he found that it wasn't the best idea if all you're concerned about is performance. Having the GPU right up against the case side panel restricts the airflow going into the GPU cooling solution, leads to higher temperatures, and with modern graphics cards, that means your GPU is going to throttle itself just a little bit. So you can still do it just fine. It's not going to make your system not work, but you are probably going to be giving up a little bit of performance unless you specifically find a case that has one of those side mounts that has enough space there to provide airflow. And you'll probably have to find some specific testing for that in order to make sure it works. Next question from Alexander Lennon. Hey Paul, what kind of mouse are you using? It looks like a great fit for me. I'm not exactly sure which mouse you're asking about, Alexander, but I actually have a couple here that I've been using recently. I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about this one because this is my main set and this one has been plugged in here for a while. This is a, from Cooler Master. It's the Master Mouse MM530. It's RGB, it's got a few profiles. Uh, it's got side buttons for uh, forward and back. And I've actually been uh, liking sort of the less expensive mice recently. Uh, so this one's only 32 bucks uh, if you buy it on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. It's, it's an affiliate link, FYI. So if you click it, it helps me out. And thank you for doing that. Um, but yeah, for 32 bucks, this has been a solid mouse. I just like the tracking on it. It's got four different DPI settings that you can do. It's got a Pixart PMW3360 infrared sensor, uh, which has been tracking pretty nicely for me. So. Uh, there it is, link in the description. I've also been using, from time to time, this mouse, and this is the Master Keys Lite L. And I don't think you can actually buy this by itself, but I imagine if you could, it would be very inexpensive. Um, I did find the combo you can get, the, the Master Keys Lite combo, and actually comes with a mechanical switch keyboard with RGB backlighting uh, for 52 ish dollars. And this little mouse, um, which I've also been using uh, just with some test setups and that kind of thing and it's also doing it's like just fine it's a good little mouse I like forward and back uh, buttons tracking's good and of course RGB if you want it to be a little blingy Alberto Esparza asks hey Paul what's the difference between 1080 and 1440 when building a PC I like this question because it's vague enough that I can sort of interpret it myself and make up my own answer. And so you're probably talking about resolution 1920 by 1080 versus 2560 by 1440 if we're strictly st sticking with 16 by 9 aspect ratios. Um, the difference right now is that 1080 is kind of the standard. You can get a very inexpensive 1080 monitor um, for around $100 and you can start gaming. Uh, the upgrade to 1440 will require more GPU horsepower. Uh, the monitors are going to probably cost a little bit more. And you also might consider when you're upgrading to higher level monitors, um, getting something that supports G-Sync if you have an NVIDIA graphics card or FreeSync if you're lucky enough to have an AMD graphics card that you were able to somehow purchase for not incredibly high prices. So for me right now, the difference is going to be spending 250 ish dollars on a graphics card that will be just fine for 1080 and maybe allow you to play at 1440 in some situations in some games and spending more like 400 to 500 dollars on a graphics card which is what you'd have to spend for a 1070 1070 ti or gtx 1080 and that would handle playing at 1440 much better there are other variables at play of course but uh, just trying to keep things quick and simple 1440 is like taking a step away from um, what most people are playing at when they're talking about console or pc gaming and sort of ascending into the realm of like Wow, it looks a lot better and cleaner and, and, and you really start to appreciate it. I like 1440 because it's a nice step up from 1080 without requiring as much GPU horsepower as gaming at 4K. Antoine Ashraf asks, does Ryzen 2600 perform better with, S with XFR2 rather than manual overclocking in gaming? So let's take a look at the Ryzen 5 2600 uh, over on Newegg. It has a boost clock, a boost frequency of 3.9 gigahertz. And depending on uh, your temperature, cooling solution, it might actually ramp up a little bit more than that. That's how XFR works, it's pretty effective, and I have found that unless you have a really good cooling solution and a really good chip for overclocking that you can somehow set to run at 4.1, 4.2 gigahertz or higher on all cores, then you're probably better sticking with the stock frequencies, because XFR can get a 2600 up to four gigahertz or a little bit higher. And if you're overclocking all cores, you might get stuck at 3.8 or 3.9. Since games do tend to prefer uh, single core performance a little bit more when it comes to overall gaming performance, it's actually shown to perform better uh, with XFR2. And again, this is situational than with just a manual overclock. So the manual overclock I would go for if you really need more uh, overall CPU horsepower, or if you're trying to get the bang for your buck option by buying a 2600 and overclocking it versus spending a little bit more money on a 2600X. 
I have three more questions, so let's do a speed round. Mosi AP asks, Paul, your PC is running 24 seven, or do you shut them off when you finish a video? I've been trying to shut down computers. I usually will shut down a computer if I have that option, but that's part of the reason why I'm trying to get the free NAS set up back up and running with a new configuration is because I want a system that's on all the time, that uses really low power, but that can handle stuff like having my personal data that I can access uh, over my network, uh, and then also the capability of running the Plex server so that it can actually use uh, the uh, TV tuner card that we have on the network to actually uh, capture TV shows that we have scheduled to record. Not that we have a lot of those anymore, but it, we, we have the, the TV tuner card and everything, so I like to keep that up and running. Josh Keys, hey Josh, uh, he asks, how is Arctic Panther doing? And any plans on upgrading my wife's PC? My wife's PC is uh, known as Hotbox, uh, and it's still up and running. I need to do a maintenance video on that one, because it's still using the uh, Opaque Mayhem's fluid in it, and I'm pretty sure that needs a, a good flush. So uh, I probably will do a video on that when I clean it out, and maybe an update on that actual build itself. Uh, as for Arctic Panther, <coughs> Still chilling here in the background, still working just fine. Uh, the Primo Chill View Fluid has pretty much turned completely clear in that. Uh, the pump is still working. The Primo Chill Flow Indicator has stopped moving, and that's still just sitting there. So I need to open that up and do a drain as well and see what I want to do with it next. So that's also coming in the future, but probably not until I get back from Computex. And final question from Richard Ship: How is the new truck running? Uh, so if you guys remember back late last year, I went and drove to Colorado. I got a Toyota Tacoma and I drove it back here. It's running great, although I do need to take it in for some maintenance. So uh, I will hopefully get to that very soon. Uh, I did get it washed just recently, so it's nice and shiny. Although it only lasted about a week before it got a bunch of water spots on it again. I do really like my new truck though. And it's been a lot of fun to drive around. It's, it's four by four and it's manual and it's fun. And finally, here is my P.O. box, guys. If you are interested in sending me anything, um, you know, legally, of course, then feel free to send me stuff. Uh, we usually open packages that arrive to my P.O. box and Kyle's P.O. box during Awesome Hardware, our live show on uh, Tuesday evenings at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. So I uh, just like to throw that out here because not everyone knows it's there. It's in, in the description of all my videos too. But that pretty much wraps it up for this video, guys. So thank you so much for watching this episode of Probing Paul. I'll be doing another Q&A video in about a month. So if you have any questions for me, post them in the comment section down below. Uh, also links to relevant stuff is in the video's description. So check down there and click on those things and, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for watching this video as well, and we'll see you next time.